um, yeah, so the uh, yeah, so kind of the differences between and then so in where I come from in North America, decolonization generally, when you talk about it, you're talking about um, sort of uh, essentially giving the land back to um, the indigenous people who the land was kind of stolen from through European colonial practices. And so this kind of difference in discourse is kind of the tensions that I work within as a scholar being from North America, but sort of uh, doing academia in the UK, let's say. Um, so yeah, this difference really highlights the kind of uh, distinct position of settler colonialism within a kind of larger discourse of decoloniality, uh, settler colonization, primarily the difference being colonization is still ongoing, settlers are still dominant sort of power um, exerters in sort of settler colonial states. So if you imagine a place like um, Canada and the US, you can imagine that is, you know, kind of historically European uh, settlers are still kind of in charge. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to call attention to the article Decolonization is not a metaphor by Eve Tuck and um, Wing Yang, two scholars from Canada who are very much proponents of the fact that decolonization in a settler colonial context is not a metaphor. It's not a kind of metaphorical uh, decolonized the curriculum, decolonized reading list. It's really still very much tied to the question of land and who gets to be the steward of this land, essentially. And that kind of brings me to how this relates to landscape, because I would say that as landscape architects and sort of landscape scholars, our primary thing that we study is land and landscape. And so therefore, decolonization being a very land based project, at least in the settler colonial context, um, it's very important to us. And so I also um, in my work tie this very much to kind of history of urban urbanization and urban theory and the kind of spatialization of urban space as very sort of um, descendant, let's say, from colonial power dynamics and sort of colonial space. And so if you think about the extractive hinterlands like mining places, places of mining, places of forestry, where we get all of our sort of resources that allow us to live in sort of comfortable urban life, these things all come from the hinterland. And then the power really in sort of political power, economic power, industrial power, these are all concentrated in cities. And so this kind of dynamic between the rural and the urban is very much a colonial conflict, if you can think of it as an extension of kind of um, colonial center like Britain and London and then sort of colonies around the world. You can see how this kind of power structure still exists in the present day manifestation of how we live. And uh, one of the scholars that I, or one of the terms that I've sort of recently um, discovered or found is this term called eco-territorial turn by, uh, termed by Maristela Stampa, the Argentinian uh, philosopher, I guess. And she uses this term to refer to the spatial nexus between climate justice activism in cities and sort of protesting resource extraction projects in the very uh, periphery of society. And so I actually see the space of protest as a very good kind of manifestation of this power dynamic between the kind of rural um, extraction sites and kind of uh, political economic power in cities. And so increasingly these protests have also been tied to kind of indigenous rights movements and uh, using kind of the juncture between indigenous land stewardship and uh, protests against extractive uh, projects um, as a kind of conversion. And that's where the eco-territorial turn comes from. And so these are some examples, um, you know, kind of from the last decade. Um, if you all remember Standing Rock protests that quite made international sort of news. Um, so in my paper, I, I write about in the decolonization, decolonization, that decolonization, decolonizing landscape paper, I write about the Wet'suwet'en protest, um, which um, basically, if you haven't read the paper, it's a protest that was happening in early 2020 before COVID happened um, in the super remote area. Um, this is a map of the site. It's a super remote um, uh, area of northern British Columbia and western Canada. And there was a proposal to build this coastal gas link pipeline through the territory of the Wet'suwet'en Nation, crossing quite a sacred um, river. Um, and so there was a blockade essentially on this very remote forestry road. Um, just to give you some context, in order to drive here from Vancouver, which is the closest city, um, it takes two days. Um, so it's quite remote. And um, this kind of caused like na national 
uh, solidarity protests started to erupt in different cities in the south, including Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa. Um, there were some university student walkouts. There were blockades on the parliament. Um, I think the rail line between Montreal and Toronto actually got blocked by protesters and was closed for um, several weeks, I think, until the COVID lockdown kind of made everyone go home. But um, yeah, and so it's really this interesting story where something that happens in a super remote location um, is really visible in kind of city. Um, and so I want this kind of calls attention to the importance of infrastructure in the kind of colonial project and settler colonial project and how histories of building infrastructure and sort of power coming from having built infrastructure and then also the power from today power disruptive power of disrupting infrastructure as a kind of um, statement against um, sort of colonial power dynamics and so in some of my research, I've also started looking at kind of other aspects of settler colonialism, which impacts not only uh, kind of indigenous uh, histories and settler histories and European histories, but also histories of kind of migrations from other parts of the world. So, for example, the railroad in Canada and the US, a lot of it was actually built by migrant workers from China in the 1870s and 80s. And so this is um, another sort of aspect of settler colonialism that I think really relates to the kind of grounded kind of infrastructures that we work with as landscape architects. And so I think this is very important kind of history for us to understand. Um, yeah, so what does this mean for us living in Europe? Because I, I, I often get this question when I give this talk in sort of the UK and Europe. It's like, we live here. This is like something that happens on the other, you know, on the other side of the Atlantic in another continent. What does this mean for us? And you know, this is a this is a quote from two scholars, um, two Canadian Indigenous scholars who who say actually the kind of legacies of settler colonialism stem completely from European colonization and therefore we do have a stake. And I would say that specifically for landscape architecture, as people who have has as a profession that has historically designed the landscape, um, we are entirely as a discipline sort of responsible and it is also our discipline's responsibility to kind of sub start to subvert some of these power dynamics that we've inherited over time disciplinary power dynamics and so one of the examples of why or how landscape architecture or landscape landscape studies has been uh kind of used as a colonial tool in the past is uh through landscape painting this is a painting by james hakewell who was an architect from the uk and he traveled to jamaica in the 1820s and he did this kind of series of paintings and essentially uh, art historians today have been sort of commenting on Hakewell's this, this particular book of Hakewell because of the way that he presented the Jamaican landscape as this very kind of pastoral flowing British countryside-esque way and also the kind of depiction of these uh, sugar plantations as kind of in a very kind of European um, way and also kind of erasing the slaves that were working in the plantations to, uh, you know, farm the sugar essentially. And so that kind of erasure, when these kind of paintings travel back to Europe and are looked at by uh, people in like London, let's say, it really does naturalize the kind of process of slavery because it's depicted as this wonderful pastoral thing that you would see even in the English countryside, which is completely false. And so I would say that the kind of representation of landscape is um, a very powerful tool that can be used for political means. Um, another way that this is uh, landscape representation can be colonial is through mapping. So this is a map that I like to show is the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is the treaty between France, uh, sorry, Spain and Portugal in the uh, 16th century, where they basically drew this dividing line um, and they were like, okay, everything east of this line belongs to Portugal and then everything west belongs to Spain. And so you can actually see that today in how uh, Brazil is primarily Portuguese speaking because it was colonized by Portugal and then the rest of Latin America is Spanish speaking. And so you can see how actually bureaucrats drawing a line in, I don't know, Spain or Portugal has a real impact on the world and has a real impact on the world even 500 years later. Um, so how does this manifest in the real world? One of the more sort of recent examples that I touch on in the paper is this uh, memorial in St. Louis, which commemorates kind of Western expansion in the United States. Basically, um, the American uh, Jefferson, the president, he sent in the uh, he sent two 
I guess, surveyors. Um, this is a Lewis and Clark expedition, if you've heard of that. So he sent two surveyors um, to map the American West, and that kind of opened the doors for settlement in Western um, and this kind of start of American imperialism and the settlement of the American West. And so this is a park that was built in the 60s, uh, designed by the famous American landscape architect Dan Kiley, who's the kind of father of American uh, modern landscape architecture, and so it's kind of designed in his style. And um, he really kind of designed the landscape in such a way to reflect the kind of uh, movement from east to west as the landscape becomes a little bit wilder. You can see here, and the it's the other way around. This is west in, in this in this image. Um, so you can see how the landscape becomes a little bit wider, wilder as you pass through the arch and go west. And so it's kind of a symbol of expansionism, essentially. And then this park was actually um, redesigned or updated by MVVA, Michael Van Valkenburg, the famous landscape architecture office in New York City, um, I believe in 2013 or something around there. And um, so they basically reinforced a lot of um, Kylie's original design. They didn't really change much. I think one main thing to kind of call out that I think was quite politically insensitive, and if they had paid a little more attention to the colonial history, they wouldn't have done this, but on site there is also a museum of Native American history. And it used to be a building on site. And as part of the kind of design and this desire by the landscape architects to preserve kind of um, views through the arch, they buried the museum underground. And so essentially now they've they've said, oh, OK, like Native American culture is is, is an underground thing. And, it, you know, it, the symbolism of that, you know, can't be lost. And so I think as landscape architects, these are things that we should be cautious of. And um, Rod Barnett, who is a landscape architect, um, uh, a Maori landscape architect who practices in the U.S. now has written uh, quite a powerful critique of this project by MVBA. So the next thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is my uh, PhD, which I recently finished. Um, it's my PhD looks at the kind of Canadian national park system, and um, I want to tell you a little bit about why I got into this project or how I got into this project. So my project really looks at the national park system as a tool of colonialism and a kind of infrastructure of settle, settler colonialism and land control. But how did I get started on this as a landscape architect? Uh, so this is the first town site that was built in the first National Park of Canada, which was established in 1885. And so this is the first kind of designed part of the National Park. And this is key because I was also looking for kind of who designed this, et cetera, et cetera. And so it turns out that the man who designed this, his name is George Stewart. This is the first ever reference I found in Canadian history referencing someone professionally as a landscape architect. And this man um, is responsible for designing, you know, the first National Park of Canada. So I found that that was very important to the history of our profession to understand. We have very direct colonial uh, ties to colonialism, and we very much work in legacies um, related to sort of our colonial caste. And one of the things that this George Stewart wrote in his one of his reports is quite appalling and I think a very good example um, of why it's important for us to be conscious of our histories. So basically he said, it is a matter of great importance that if possible, the Indians should be excluded from the park. Their destruction of game and depredations among the ornamental trees make their too frequent visits to the park a matter of great concern. And so he actually explicitly wrote in his notes that we need to find a way to remove the indigenous people from this landscape because they are disrupting the kind of natural views that we are trying to promote. So this is where my kind of project began, my PhD. And so my PhD has kind of evolved into um, a little bit broader study, but basically my PhD is called Nature Unsettled, that's the title of my thesis, and it has kind of three main parts. The first part looks at the kind of early history of the development of the national park system and how the kind of landscape designs designed by people like Stewart were really um, European in character and as a, and a way of kind of imposing European values onto um, Canadian landscape or North American landscape. Um, the second part looks at the kind of history of, um, uh, it kind of takes the history towards the Pacific coast because actually the national park system in Canada is um, initially was established through lobbying by the railway company because no one was riding the train through the kind of remote mountain regions. And so they made that they lobbied the government to build a national park here so they could you know, get tourist revenue essentially. And so actually this transnational railway, which 
crosses the entire continent of Canada was a very key infrastructure in British imperialism because it allowed a route from London to Hong Kong entirely within the British Empire. So you could take a steamship from, or well, take a train from London to Liverpool and then a steamship from Liverpool to Montreal. And then you take the railway across Canada, you get off in Vancouver, and then you take another steamship um, to Japan and also to um, Hong Kong. And so it was a kind of way, and so this is a really key infrastructure. And I think um, tied to the fact that the Western parts of the Canadian railway were very much built by um, migrant workers from China in the 1870s. This is a very important part of the history. And so I've kind of tied the making of wilderness in Canada to kind of um, stories of Pacific migration. And then the final part of my PhD talks about kind of nature from a different perspective, which looks at a flood from 2013, which disrupted um, a lot of infrastructure in Banff National Park and also the city of Calgary, which is downstream. And I look at the agency of the river through its kind of destruction of infrastructure um, as a way of starting to think about how to work with non-human um, actors in landscape design. Uh, and so very, very quickly, this is the very last thing, um, agency and non-human agency in landscape architecture is one of the things that I've been working on recently. And so um, one of the things that I have kind of uh, think about is that um, this is the Farnsworth house. Uh, Mies van der Rohe, famous architect, designed this house outside of Chicago. He designed it on these stilts so that the river, in, it has this kind of seasonal uh, flooding cycle so that the river could sort of easily pass through. Um, however, he did not design it high enough because if it was higher, it wouldn't be as aesthetically pleasing as it is. It's kind of low plain. And so actually this building floods all the time. And um, I think that's one of the things where the tensions between, you know, architecture, landscape architecture and kind of agency of non-human processes uh, really, this becomes really evident. And it's it's like, you know, you can't pretend to work with it. You really do have to work with it. And so this ties back a little bit to my own research. Um, this is a pavilion in Banff National Park, which is the first national park of Canada. Um, it was actually designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's his only building in Canada. Um, it was designed in the floodplain of the main river that runs through the town. Um, also floods all the time because it was built in this kind of prairie style, which is the very long, low to the ground kind of design. And so not suitable for a floodplain, but there it is. Um, and so it lasted, I think, about two decades before it was demolished because it just was being flooded so often. And then when I was doing some archival research, I found this really funny article. Um, which is from the 60s and it's talking about how there used to be some foundations of the building left in the kind of floodplain and how they've now been completely washed away and so the headline like swamp swallows Banff Memorial to Frank Lloyd Wright which found that quite a powerful statement of non-human agency and then further to that the kind of first line of this article which is the inscrutable mire of the Bow River Valley has consumed the remaining traces of what was once a magnificent monument to the genius of one of the world's greatest architects and I I'm like, yeah, there's there's non-human power, and we can we can fight back against the the kind of um, colonial building regimes that have been that we work within. And so this is, um, yeah, this is this is something that I'm working on currently. It's uh, I have a book chapter coming out um, talking about this specific pavilion um, and the kind of non-human agency around that. And so I think we'll just end it there because we're out of time. Um, yeah, so be part of the inscrutable mire. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank you.